<laughs> oh, this morning, as we, uh, we started a couple weeks ago looking at worldviews, and we looked at, at the way that uh, the differing worldviews, and, and that our worldview is basically how we look at things. We started out in the first, the first week about worldviews. We looked at about why our worldview is important. What, what is the importance of having a worldview? And we, we looked at how most of the world, their life has no meaning. Most of the world, uh, we, we looked at the first part of Ecclesiastes where Solomon said, Everything I do and everything that I, I do as a, as a man and everything I do to promote myself and everything is vanity and it has no basically no purpose but then he then he ended up and he said in Ecclesiastes 12 13 let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter fear God and keep his commands for this is man's all so we see that that when you look at things from man's point of view that you you really don't have a purpose but if you look at it from God's point of view uh, and you look at it in, in a Christian worldly view we see that fearing God and keeping his commands gives our life purpose then last week we looked at the difference in the beginning of life we looked at how Christians are different than anybody else you know a lot of a, a lot of religions out there they believe that there are there is a God they believe there's a creator uh, a lot of them, a lot of people believe that there's no creator and it just, life just happened. But the difference between Christians and all the other religions is, is not only do we believe there's a God, we believe there's a trinity. And we believe that Jesus Christ is God. And we believe that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for us as God. Not as a creation of God, not as a not as a, a half God or anything like that that Jesus Christ is God himself and that's what sets us as Christians apart from all other religions when it comes to to looking at uh, the beginning of life and how we began but today we're going to look at something else we're going to look at why are we here why are you here what is what is our real meaning for being here now I know that we talked back at the beginning and at the beginning of this study and we talked about that fearing God and keeping his commands this is man's all but listen to keep God's commands and to fear God is not why we're here that is not why we were created last week we talked about being created but this week we're going to talk about why were we created um, if you did not believe in God. If you were if you were just a worldly person and you you were out in the world, your worldview would be much the same as the majority of America and the majority of the world. I am here to please myself. I am here to advance myself. I am here to get all that I can get. I am here to, to, to leave something for my children. I am here to leave a legacy that promotes me. And, and everything that I am going to do in life is going to be about me. And that is basically what the world teaches. Now, some people, they, they, their worldview revolves around that maybe my purpose is to, to help others, or maybe my purpose, but ultimately, most people look at it as, I'm here to get what I can get. And that seems to be the way, and the, and the um, that seems to be the, the, the main thought, or the main worldview of most people in the world. If you were one of those people that believed in evolution and believed that we happened by chance and we happened by a stronger survival, what would your worldview be of why did that happen? Why did, why did you evolve to what you are? Why did you become what you are? What is your purpose in being here? And basically, if you believed in those things, then you would, you would have to admit that humans really have no purpose in being here. We're just here. But we believe that God created us. But let's look today at why 
God created us. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to look a little bit about uh, our, our real reason to be here. And this is, a, uh, this is a passage that a lot, of, a lot of Southern Baptists are afraid of, and we don't get into it a whole lot. Um, because of some of the words in it. We don't want to be, list, we don't, we don't want to be labeled as a Calvinist. Uh, even though the Southern Baptists are full of Calvinists, a lot of the, us that are not don't want to be listed as one, so we stay away from this, this chapter. But Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence having made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of time He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in Him. In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for this day and we thank You for Your words. And we thank You, Lord, that You did choose us. We thank You, Lord, that You predestined us to be Your adopted children, that You, that you have, have claimed us, Lord. We thank You for that. And as we look at Your Word today, we just pray that You would just... Show us, Lord, how we need to look at our lives and our purposes according to this. In your name we pray. Amen. We were created by God for a reason. And it, it was not to fear Him and keep His command as we learned last or a couple weeks ago in Ecclesiastes. Our purpose and our reason for being here is to have a relationship with God Himself. That is our purpose. That is why God created Adam and Eve. He created them for a relationship. Now, we, as, we people are relational creations. God, when He made the heavens and the earth, and He, he started to make light and, and darkness, and He started to make, separate the waters, and He raised up the land, and He created the green things, and He created the animals and the fish in the sea, and He created all these things. Every time He created something, and He looked at it, and He said, it is good. But when He got to the last day, and it said that He created man, He looked at it, and He said, it is not good for man to be alone. And for that reason, he created woman because he knew that as a man, he needed relationship. He needed to have somebody to relate to. He needed to have a companion. We as, uh, as people, one of the, the worst uh, punishments that you can give somebody. If you've got somebody in, in prison, the worst thing that they do to them is, is put them in solitary. They put them in a place that separates them from everybody else and they put them in solitary and, and, and it, it's, it's one of the worst things where the, they can't have contact with anybody else. It, is, it has happened... Uh, any, anybody see the movie Castaway? Where Tom Hanks got stranded on the island... 
and, and out there for four years, he basically almost went crazy because he was separated from human companionship and he was separated from all types of relationships to the point that he even took a volleyball and made it his friend. He made that Wilson. Everybody knows Wilson. Thought it was ironic that his dentist was Spalding. But <laughs> he, uh, he created for himself a companion because we as, as humans, we need relationships. And, and there are people who claim they like to be a loner. Well, even those who are loners need somebody. They, 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 even if they're out, you know, hermits, they'll come to town every once in a while. They'll, they'll have some sort of interaction from time to time. If not, they just sit and talk to themselves. But they have to have some sort of relationship. You see, God wanted that relationship. And, and the angels were created beings as well. And, and they, were, they were there to serve God. They are, their purpose is to serve God and glorify God. We also are to serve and glorify God. But it's not the purpose that He made us for. He made us for relationships. He made us to, to love Him and to have, have that interconnection with Him. Now, we are to love Him. We are to worship Him. We are to serve Him. But that is not why we're here. We are to do those things because of what He has done for us. We are to do those things. We are to worship God because He loved us, because He created us, because He is there for us. And that gives us the reason to keep His commands, to worship Him. Now, let me, let me say right off the bat that keeping His commands and worshiping Him does not create the relationship. That is not how we establish the relationship. You see, we are told that He established the relationship. God is the one who establishes it. And He keeps the relationship. It is up to us to thank Him and glorify Him for the relationship that He's given to us. Now, everybody has the opportunity for that relationship. And that's why I said that a lot of people stay away from this, uh, this chapter because... It has the word predestined in it. And, and so many people, uh, if, you, if you know anything about what's been going on in the Baptist churches, the, the predestination is a thing and that uh, a lot of the Presbyterians believe and, and, and a lot of people in the Baptist church has, is going toward what they call Calvinism. And, and it's a belief that says God has predestined before time he chose us before time. But it says that they, He has only chosen the elect. And He's only chosen certain people who will become Christians. And it is it is chosen ahead of time. There's nothing you can do about it. But that is not what this means. God has chosen each and every person in the world. He has chosen us all. Matter of fact, in, in first or Second Peter, it's told that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to redemption. Or repentance. If, if we believed that God had only a chosen elect few, then, then we would have to do away with those, those, those things like John 3.16 where it says, Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord. We have to do away with 2 Peter 3.9 that says that God's will is that none would perish. You see, God created everybody to have a relationship with Him. And He has chosen everybody to have a relationship with Him. And He is predestined that all should come to know Him as their Lord and Savior. And that's when He gives us a choice. And He gives us a choice as to whether we want to, uh, to keep that relationship, if we want to have that relationship with Him. 
The, the, the sad thing is, is that God calls us and He draws us and He wants us and He desires us for His re, this relationship. But so many people in the world deny it. And they, they run from it and they say, we don't want anything to do with this God and we don't want this relationship with Him. I can do just fine on my own. And that is the, the world's worldview. I have, my purpose is me. I am here for me. I am here for me and mine, and that's it. That's a choice that they have made, and they have chosen to have that worldview. God did not instill that worldview in them. He did not give you one worldview and give them another worldview. He, 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 his worldview is, is that He desires that we should all be His children. That we should all have a loving relationship with Him. If you didn't believe that God gave everybody that opportunity, and, and I know a lot of people, a, a lot of good people that I know, a lot, of, a lot of pastors that I'm friends with, that believe this way. And they believe that there is a chosen few. And that, that elect few is all that will be saved. And that's all that can be saved. And here's my argument. If you believe that, then you would have to say that God created a certain number of people to go to hell. If you didn't believe that God gave everybody the opportunity to become a Christian, then you would have to believe that God created people to go to hell. That's not my God. That's not a loving God. That's not a God who's, who's just. That's not a God who's merciful. See, God didn't create anybody for hell. God didn't create, create anybody that would not, could not have the opportunity to believe in Him and could not have the opportunity to become a Christian. And that, therefore, our worldview should be this. God made me special. But He made everybody special. He gave me the opportunity to become a Christian and He gave everybody else the opportunity to become a Christian. And it is my job... It is my responsibility to worship Him and praise Him because of the relationship with Him. And because that He gave me the opportunity to have that relationship with Him, then it is also my responsibility to share that relationship with others. And it is my responsibility to take that message to others and give them the opportunity and give them the, the option that they can come to know the Lord as well. Rock Collins, who, is, who used to be the pastor at Indian Springs Baptist Church at, out in Kingsport, and now he is, uh, he's, works with TBC or TBMB, uh, Tennessee Baptist, and I forget what his... Um, what his actual title is, but he's, he's kind of over the outreach for the Tennessee Baptist. And he, he made the statement, he said, he said, I'm not going to get into whether or not the, 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 the elect or not. He said, I'm not going to get into that argument right now. He said, but one thing I can tell you is the more people I tell about God, the more elect I find. And that should be our view, is, is, is we have to consider and, and respect the fact that we all have that opportunity for relationship with God. And because of that, we need to share it with each and every person we come in contact with. You see, when He comes to us and He draws us and we submit to Him, then we become His. We, it says that we are adopted as His children. We become His children and, and, and that relationship... Now, any of you that's got kids, you know that the relationship between a parent and a child is one of the strongest bonds that there can ever be. Stronger than that of the husband and wife, stronger than that of any friends or brothers or sisters, the, the bond between a, a, a parent and the child should be, it's one of the strongest. And that's the type of relationship that God desires. That's the type of relationship that He has prepared us for. That's the type of relationship that He has drawn us to. And, and because of that, He wants to adopt us into His family. And by doing so, or in order to do so, it said that He sent His Son 
to redeem us. That we are only redeemed and we only become His adopted children. We only have that opportunity for relationship through Jesus Christ and His blood and His dying on the cross for us. Do you really believe that Jesus Christ would have come and died for only a few of us? Or only a certain number of us? You see, Jesus died for all of us. He came to give us all the opportunity to come to know Him. And then when we, when we accept Him and we, we take that redemption. Now, to, to be redeemed. Any, any of y'all remember, I'm going to tell my age here. I remember S&H green stamps. Anybody remember those? I remember the store used to sit down there about where the, I guess it, where the Plasma Center is now is, is where it used to sit there uh, on Ash Street. And I remember going down there with my grandparents. I, I will have to say I, it was with my grandparents that I went. I was just a little fellow when we had it. But I do remember it. But you would save up those you would save up those green stamps and you would put them in a book and you'd get so many in a book and you would take that book and I remember that that when we would go with them, my, my grandparents would give me the catalog and give me and my brother the catalog and they'd tell us how many we had. And we got to pick something when we would go down there. And we would get to pick what we wanted. And we would redeem our coupons. We would take those, those coupons or those, those stamps that we had and we would redeem them and we would, we would purchase something with what we had. And that's what it means. To redeem means to purchase. It means to, to trade in. You, you, didn't, you didn't purchase with money, but you took these stamps that you had collected and you traded your stamps for something. That was redeeming. And Jesus Christ redeemed us. He purchased us, but not with money, it, he took something that was the most precious to him, which was his blood, and he traded it for us. He traded his own life for our life. He traded his own blood for our relationship. You see, Jesus wanted us to have that relationship with God and with Him. And for that reason, He was willing to pay the price. He was willing to give it all so that we could have that. And then it says when he did that, he sealed us. He sealed us to himself. Now, when you, when you look at what it means to seal something, it has a couple different meanings. Now, now me personally, in, in my business, we have had a lot of people... Uh, over the years that have decided that, that they needed our stuff more than we did. And at one point, I had one of my vans broken into, and they got over $7,000 worth of tools in one night. And, and for that reason, from the beginning of, of our business, we have always marked our tools, and we, we put our name and our, our phone number and all that on our tools. So that hopefully at some point we can go into a pawn shop and identify this as ours. Unfortunately, that's never happened. We've never been able to go back and, and identify anything because I'm sure they sand it off, but we, we engrave it deep. We mark it as ours. We seal it, basically. We say, this is mine. This belongs to Murray Services. But not only do I do that with our work tools or with the tools that belong to the company, but with my personal tools I do that. Everything I have is marked with a WM. I'll, I'll do, do it that way because any way I turn it, it still says WM. My name being William Murray. You can look at it from one direction or the other direction. It don't matter. Christy made fun of me for that. But my grandfather did that a long time ago. His name was William Olin Murray, and he marked everything W-O-M. And any way you turned it, it said W-O-M. Well, mine says W-M, and any way you turn it. But I mark it that way because not only do I have, I, I try to buy the best of tools, but so do uh, the guys who work for me. We, we provide them with tools, and, and we all have pretty much the same tools because we try to buy the best. And, and so therefore, when we're out on a job together, I want to be able to distinguish my tools from everybody else's tools. So therefore, I mark them with my mark. 
And that way I can identify what is mine. God wants you to be identified as His. He wants, he wants you to be identified. So His sealing you, His marking you, is so that everyone will know that you're His. That seal should be evident. We've been talking about this. We talked about it um, in our last study on Wednesday nights when we talked about pursuing holiness. And we've been talking about it with our horizontal Jesus. If you're, not, if you're not coming on Wednesday nights, let me give you a plug here. We're talking about the horizontal Jesus, meaning the relationship we have with others. But in, in it we say that it should be evident your seal should be evident. Everybody that sees you outside of this building, everybody who sees you out in the world should be able to look at you and see God's mark on you. They should be able to say he is a Christian. He belongs to God. He has, he has a relationship with Jesus Christ because of the way you act. And that your seal should be evident to everybody. But not only was a, is the seal so that you can be identified, but also your seal is the seal back in those days, they also had a seal that was similar to a signature. Today you sign a contract with a signature. And when you put your signature on a contract, that means it's legal. That means that it's binding. God's seal is His signature. Of the new covenant... The new covenant, I should have saved this, this till next week when we have communion, but His new covenant, which was signed in Christ's blood. Jesus tells us as we go through the communion, we talk about Jesus said, this is the blood, my blood of the new covenant. His blood is how He sealed us, is how He marked us in that, in that legal binding contract that He has for you and me. We are sealed with Him. And, and, and that is a mark. He has purchased us. It is a guarantee. It's a guarantee that says you have eternal life if you have a relationship with me. You see, because of the relationship with Jesus Christ, because of the redemption that he paid for us, we can have a relationship with him. This morning, I got a simple question. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? That's the simplest question we can ask. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? The, the thing is, is some people, I, I've heard people say, well, you know, I pray and I pray and I do this and I... That's not the question. That's not what establishes the relationship. Coming to church and singing, coming to church and worshiping does not establish the relationship. The relationship is established when you accept the calling. You've been chosen. You're predestined. God has already, Jesus has already died for you. Jesus has already paid for you. Jesus has already redeemed you. All you've got to do is accept it. All you've got to do is say, yes, Lord, I want that relationship with you. I give you my life. This morning, have you established that relationship with with Jesus Christ. If you've not, then we're going we're to have an invitation here in just a moment. And I'm going to ask you to come forward and, and, and establish that relationship. Accept Jesus as your Savior. But maybe you're here this morning and your worldview has not been where it needs to be. You accepted Jesus maybe a long time ago or maybe recently or whatever, you, but you've, you've accepted Jesus as your Savior, but you've not been living like it. You've not been, you, your worldview has still been, I'm, I'm going to serve me, I'm going to serve my family, I'm going to serve something else. You've not, your worldview has not been, I'm going to serve God, I'm going to keep that relationship with Him. If that's you this morning and your relationship has not, with Jesus has not been number one in your life, then this morning come and make that right. Come and reestablish that relationship. He re he's already redeemed you. He's already paid for you. This morning, the invitation is, what is your relationship like with Jesus?